a Living History production. I'm Peter Hart, and for the last 40 years, I've interviewed thousands of veterans about their experience of war. Join me on a journey through the pages of history. Welcome to Peter Hart's Military History. Hello, and good morning. It's Gary Bain's Military History, part 28. Hooray! Hello. Hello, Pete. How are Am you? Am I allowed on this one? You're allowed on, but you can't say very much. Or, whatever you say has to be interesting. Oh, actually, you can't say anything. <laughs> yeah, just get quiet. And welcome to Tier 4 London. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? I'm looking out this window and it's just so sunny and bright and little rainbows everywhere in the sky. Well, it's not because you had me get up early, didn't you, Pete? Half past six in the morning you had me get up for this, didn't you? But then you didn't tell me that your appointment afterwards had been cancelled. No, oh, thought, thought it'd be a nice surprise for you. And what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? We're doing, we're doing Aylmer Hunter Weston. Uh, you might have heard of him. Have you, have you heard of him? Have you, have you heard of him, Gary? Uh, no. I've heard of, I've heard of, uh, uh, is it Hunter Banter? Hunter Banter, yes. Uh, it's a bit disrespectful of you, Gary, to uh, to call him that. But, uh, yes, he was, uh, well, he's a butcher and a bungler, isn't he? He's the ultimate butcher and bungler, isn't he? He makes Haig look like some sort of child in a in a sweet shop. Yeah, I mean, in The Great War by Les uh, Carlian, he's described as one of the Great War's spectacular incompetence. Ooh, that's not good, is it? No, so he's got a lot to live up to. Yeah, well, it, it, I think I think I hope people enjoy this podcast because there was requests for this, and we have responded as quickly as we ever done. I think the request about was made six or uh, seven months ago, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. And we've leapt into action, <laughs> leapt into action, and uh, we're going to do uh, hunt to us because actually this buffoon, this idiot, this halfwit, this uh, this butcher and bungler was once a rising star, wasn't he? In the ga- Gary, in the in the Gary. In the pre-war army, uh, so so who is he? Tell me who he is, Gary. As you're in charge. Well, he was born in a, a place called Hunterston, which uh, is, is relevant into the Scottish landed gentry in 1864. His father was a, a, a Gould Western, and he'd been a hero of Lucknow in the Indian Mutiny in 1857. And his mother, one Jane Hunter was a member of a, a, a distinguished aristocratic family, well, in their eyes at least, but she was the daughter and heir to the 25th Laird of Hunterston, so Hunter's Town. And uh, Gould had to add the, the surname to, to, to secure later inheritance rights as a spouse, as a spouse, so hence Hunter Weston. It's all clever stuff in this hereditary title stuff. Right, so he would. They, they were a reasonably wealthy family, but but uh, but 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 not 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 a, not particularly first rate aristocrats, and not co- commerce. Definitely not commerce. This family, from the sound of it, not like the Hagues. No, not like the Hagues. So uh, in 1875, he's sent off to uh, to be educated. Where does he go, Gary? What school is? Uh, is it? Does he go to the local comprehensive? <laughs> <laughs> no, he goes to Wellington, uh, the motto of which is, the path of duty is the way to glory. Oh, I felt me backbone stiffen slightly, or something stiffened. I've not, uh, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, and he did well. He, he won uh, academic prizes as well as excelling at rugby, football and athletics. In fact, throughout his life, he was, he was very good at, uh, at sports. So a sporting type, yeah. And, uh, and th- then he decides, well, as... Wellington is an army school, isn't it? So he's going to go into the army. Um, and, and he decides to take a commission in the Royal Engineers. Now, that's a difficult choice, isn't it? You, you didn't go into the Royal Engineers, did you, Gary? No, uh, there might be a reason for that. I didn't have a beard for one. <laughs> well, you put him down just to that. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly that. I couldn't, I couldn't stroke a beard. Couldn't stroke a beard or anything else. Uh, so he he's going. It, it is a difficult thing, particularly then, and it had a reputation as attracted sort of the brightest, uh, the most intellectual types, uh, and they had to be good at things like maths, as it does now. Uh, as it does now. Well, them the Royal Signals yep. and the Royal Logistics Corps, all loved by ordinary infantry soldiers. Those those three corps are, are just everybody loves them. 
They never make derogatory remarks about them at all. No. Anyway, uh, so he, 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 yeah, it's difficult to to get in, and uh, and uh, it, it, it's it's something to be achieved. So uh, he goes from Wellington into 1882. He attends the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich, uh, and uh, does he pass high enough to be commissioned into the Royal Engineers? Because you have to be in the top, very top section to to pass it. Does he? Does he? Does he? Tell us! Tell us! Does he? Yes. <laughs> Give me more details. Yeah, he does. He he uh, he commissioned into the Royal Engineers in February eighteen eighty four, and uh, that's just the start, isn't it? Because that's basically as as the system normally is. That's your basic training as an officer. Now you've done well and you've qualified for the training as a Royal Engineer. So he then goes to the School of Military Engineering from eighteen eighty four to eighteen eighty six, uh, where he studies engineering. That's a surprise. Military engineering, in fact. God, God, why did they? Well, it was seen such as military fortifications and uh, uh, there was obviously a lot of new technology coming in. So it, it included things such as te- telegraphy, uh, electrical developments and photography. Blimey. So all this, as well as the usual fortifications, demolition, uh, bridges uh, and road building, all the usual military stuff, they're now getting this modern stuff added. And we've got to remember things like that. that that's, they're, they're always at the forefront, the Royal Engineers, aren't they? Um, it's interesting that he passed for his captaincy exams uh, while he was actually under training. Uh, but that doesn't mean he's promoted to captain. It just means he's qualified to be promoted to captain. Yeah, he wouldn't have been senior enough at no, that point. Of course point. not. Uh, he'd have to wait his turn, wouldn't he? Uh, you had to wait a long time to be made a captain, didn't you? I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, his first posting, it just sounds so exciting. It just sounds like... It, it sends a little tremor running through all me, all me extremities. What is his first posting? It's the 1st Division Telegraph Battalion, Royal Engineers at all the shop. Just, it, it, it's like my heart is singing with excitement. Uh, and he goes there in March 1886. Uh, and it, it's a fairly routine life. It, it says here he did some valuable work of strengthening the defences of Milford Haven. <laughs> well, it's never been invaded <laughs> since. It's just... It was an important port, but it just just made me chuckle. That I'm sure I'm sure all over the country, people listening to our podcast are going Milford Haven. Why bother? <laughs> oh, he's still doing lots of sport, uh, lots of cricket, and he takes to amateur dramatics. Uh, you can make jokes about Hunter Weston and amateur dramatics, but it, you can make jokes about amateur dramatics. Full stop. You can really, can't you? But we're not going. No, to. we're not. And he then volunteers for service with the Indian Engineer Corps, uh, which is on the nor- uh, serving on the northwest frontier. And he leaves England or, or Britain uh, in December 1889. Uh, this this shows that he, he's an ambitious young officer because for a Royal Engineer, the, nor- the northwest frontier is there's, there's lots that needs to be done. There's lots happening out there. It, it's a place to be. Um, his, he, he goes out there and his first active service is in a punitive expedition. We, the, the word punitive expedition, if you're a fan of empire, as some people are, you, you have to think about what a punitive expedition is. It's not, it's not often good, is it? Uh, and this is into the Moranzi Valley in 1891. Uh, that's a, give, me, give me a picture, a, a little word picture of what this is like, Gary. What, 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 does, it, what does it mean he's doing? Uh, we didn't. Well, he, he, he's, he's crisscrossing what is a wild, mountainous terrain. He, he's establishing fortified posts. He's having to blast roads from solid rock, and he's demolishing the tribesmen's fortifications. Now he did well. You know, he did very well. He was promoted to captain when just twenty-seven years old, and he took a company command in the Indian Engineer Corps. So he's done well whilst he's in India. And it's funny because I interviewed a, a, a couple of engineer officers who were out there in the 1920s and 30s, uh, and it, it hadn't changed much. They were still building roads, still blowing up village fortifications, and, and it, it was an amazing period for the Royal Engineers. Anyway, he's, he's promoted, as you say. Um, hobbies, lots. Of, it's almost obligatory, isn't it, uh, in, uh, in, for Indian officers? Lots of big game hunting. And I think by this time he's developed a personality. Um, 
and and I'm going to use the words for good or for bad because it's uh, in many ways it's Hunter Weston's personality which I think acts as a sort of lightning rod for for criticism. Um, so what's he like? Give me an idea of what he's like. Well, he, he was he was well dressed, bit of a dandy, club, bit of a dandy, clubbable. Now, do you mean that you're quite clubbable, <laughs> Gary? Do you mean that I? He was, do you mean I go out to social engagements oh, outside of lockdown and, and that people flock to my side, or do you mean they no, flock? I mean, every time you go out, somebody clubs you. <laughs> Usually, the uh, local police officer. Nonsense. Um, now he was full, full to the brim of self confidence. He wasn't just confident; he was arguably. Overconfident. Was he overflowing with self-confidence? He was overflowing with self-confidence. If self-confidence could be bottled and sold, he'd have made a fortune. And uh, what about his appearance? So dandy. I, I, I like this bit that I noticed in. in oh, I should have mentioned uh, a lot of this stuff is from a book. We uh, I noticed at the start it says, "Don't forget to mention." <laughs> we forgot to mention a slashing man of action by Elaine McFarland. And that is about the only book you can buy to read about him. As a, and there should be more biographies coming. But it says he had luxuriant chestnut hair. Now, what colour would you say your hair was, Gary? Well, I, as you know, I've not got much hair, but you have luxuriant chestnut hair. You also had a splendid moustache, as he Thank did. Thank you. He did have a splendid moustache. Um, or you might describe him as a complete arse, which is why it's fitting to describe him in, in the way that we did. Yes. He, he, so he, 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 he's, a, he's a man of his time, uh, but he, he is he is quite a character, yes. Uh, okay, he's a, a very much, I would say, wouldn't you, a career soldier. Uh, yeah, that... yeah, and, and, and he, was, he was very capable of standing up for his men when the conditions of services weren't right. He would make a case for, his, for the soldiers. Do you think he was popular with his men? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you don't know, do you? Probably, probably not in the way that he imagined. Yeah, that, let, let, let's leave it at that because uh, we don't know. We don't know. Now, his next campaign, another campaign, was in Waziristan, eighteen ninety-four to five. And again, he's doing well. He's he's showing. Uh, he's enthusiastic. He's got a capacity and appetite for hard work, um, and he's given command of all the Sapa forces with the Waziristan field force. On a punitive expedition, <laughs> you've been a you've been a very naughty boy. <laughs> we'll come and kill you all uh, in December eighteen ninety four. Same duties are blowing up forts, building forts. <laughs> Sorry, the British armies are one. It could be worse. It could be the other way around. <laughs> building forts, blowing them up, uh, making roads through the well, it's torturous terrain. He was even slightly wounded. Describe to me in detail the wound he suffered. Yeah, it, it was a very slight wound, but he did leave a permanent scar just above his left ear. Was so in amongst his luxuriant chestnut golden locks. It's not golden if they're chestnuts, is it? Now, at this point, he was promoted to brevet major in August 1895. And he, he, uh, he had demonstrated a solid professionalism and competence. And uh, it marked him out as an officer of great promise. Now, uh, next thing is really exciting for me because I'm, I'm working on the Sudan a lot. April 1896, he's sent out as a special service officer to join Kitchener's Dongola expedition. This is uh, the first part of... Was, get, was that punitive? Yes, it bloody was. <laughs> Everybody got punified. <laughs> um, it was to gain revenge for the, uh, uh, the, 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 the death of Gordon and the... the, the, the the, the whole cartoon thing in 1885-6. So uh, he joins Kitchener's band of boys, as they're described as. Uh, to the modern mind, of course, that's uh, uh, interesting. Uh, there were a bunch of sapper officers, and he was given general duties. Uh, he was based at Wadi Halfa, and uh, and my the, the bit I'm most drawn to is that he was responsible for surveying and dynamiting some of the Nile cataracts. Now, this is dangerous work, dangerous work indeed. And, uh, and you're going to read uh, a quote from it. And this quote, I want you to notice how funny it is, because it is. I started my work alone assisted by such of the natives as were likely to have a special knowledge of the subject. As I was a fairly good swimmer, 
and had had experience of using mashaks, which were inflated skins, in India, I was able to carry out reconnaissance to Kitchener's satisfaction. My costume was simple, artistic and well suited to the purpose, for it consisted only of a large helmet, a sun umbrella and my birthday suit. Now, <laughs> I'd find it difficult to imagine disliking a man who's capable of writing that sentence. Um, do you think... Well, well, there's two things that come to my mind. Well, I'll, I'll go first. You can say, well, I'm, I can see the other things come to your mind. Well, would there be crocodiles in the Nile? <laughs> ah, baity, bait, bait. And what, would you, what do you think as you, as you read that? What were your thoughts? Well, there's two things. There's describing your naked body as artistic and um, consisting only of a large helmet. Was it purple? I'm not going there, Pete. Right. Um, now, he, he, he went on to other duties uh, on Kitchener's staff. Um, Some of which he had to keep his clothes on for. Yes, he's very disappointed for a young boy. Uh, he's, and he, he's, he, he's, a, he's a lot of logistical stuff, and it's very difficult sometimes with Kitchener because what have we discussed before in, in, in these podcasts about Hague? About Hague? in the Sudan and is that Kitchener doesn't often tell you what's going on until until very late on and uh, like all of the staff um, um, Hunter Weston has trouble with this Um, but the campaign does end in triumph uh, the capture of Dongola and the key town of Berber which is a sort of staging post for the next stage of the the reconquest of the Sudan and in particular going on to Omdurman and uh, Khartoum so he's done well hasn't he Uh, and it's he's recommended uh, by Kitchener to apply for staff college and uh, he does now, by this time, you might be thinking, oh, he's a bright spark, this bright spark, he's doing well. So what happens when he goes to Staff College? He goes in January 19, 1896. What happens there? Yeah, he, he was one of the 10 officers that was nominated by General Sir Garnet Wolseley, who was the Army Commander-in-Chief at that time. And he studied the full military curriculum, uh, but he also secured first-class uh, qualification as a German interpreter, which, you know, given what subsequent events would be very useful. It, it's um, a, it's it, a big thing as well, though, isn't it? it it's not easy to get a first-class qualification in, in a language while you're simultaneously studying a full-time staff course. And at one point, 1898 and 99, he was also master of the Staff College Hounds, so he was very active whilst at the Staff College. Now, now Haig didn't get that. I think Alan Big got it. Uh, that's quite a big thing, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's not a military thing, but it's a sign of, well, is it popularity or is it influence? Or is it both? I think it's both, to be honest. Now, uh, uh, would you say uh, at, at Staff College he gets ge- the general Staff College training? And uh, is one of the things that is important is he gets all the usual Staff College stuff, uh, the stages of a battle, uh, winning the firefight, the attack and all the rest of it. But he also, and it's important, is the idea that senior commanders, once battle plans have been disseminated and done, you should... Def- you should defer to the man on the spot and not interfere. Fully enough, that's quite modern in sound, but it can lead to trouble and, and would at Gallipoli, for instance. Um, uh, although the worst offender, let's be honest, is a, a Sir Ian Hamilton, General Sir Ian Hamilton. He didn't go to Staff College, did he? Uh, and uh, he said that no Gordon Holland should ever go to Staff College. And uh, we know... And we know the first one that did. Well, the first <laughs> one we know did, yes. Lovely, yes. lovely, lovely David, David Barron. Yeah. Now, it's, it's worth noting that four of the uh, contemporaries at, at Star College would would be killed in the Boer War. Oh, are you, you know, so, are you in some way saying that it's not only the First World War where people get killed or are at risk? Are you in some way saying that actually these soldiers from earlier who became generals actually had their own risks and dangers to suffer? You're not saying that, are no. you? No. Oh, you're not good. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, yeah, of course I'm saying that. What I'm trying to say is take the focus away from just as you know these people through the First World War. They all have lives. They all have careers. They all had risks, dangers. They lost friends. They were on campaigns. You know, this man, Hunter Weston, has basically been on campaigns since he... he, uh, Since he... uh, Was in nappies? uh, was in nappies, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, oh, that was a good phrase. Thank you. I was clearly struggling. You were. I, I, I'm yeah. always there for you. 
So he's 34 by this time, and, and by the time the Boer War comes along. And, it gave, and he's a major, isn't he? He's a major, a major. And it gives him an opportunity to, to shine. He's appointed to command a mounted engineer field troop, and he was attached to Sir John French's uh, cavalry division. Who else is attached to that that we know? Well, you've got Haig there. Well, I think we said in the, the previous Haig podcast, there are a number of the, the contemporaries from the Great War are, are serving... Uh, under French's command at, at this time. What is this troop? It's highly mobile. It's got telegraphers. They've got a bridging ca- capability. And uh, he, it, it, it's, it's, it's in December 1899, just in time for the Black Week. We have a lot of them now. It, it would be Black Month or Black Year now, wouldn't it? Uh, HW became the commander of the whole engineer forces attached to the cavalry division. And the- HW, you, you, you're now calling him... Oh, sorry. Don't just call him H... I'm, I'm, getting, I'm too informal. Hunter Weston, yeah. so I do apologise. Uh, they're attached to cavalry, and they're in Cape Colony. And and what what's his role? Come on, describe to me his role. Well, he's he's supplying support uh, to the logistical and engineers uh, in a fast moving cavalry squadron. So, uh, you know, we talked before about the the fast moving advance up to Clip Drift to relieve Kimberley, and he he was there and. Uh, he was uh, one of the first to send news back by field telegraph to Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Haig. We've heard of him, who was uh, French's chief of staff at the time. So He's supplying logistical and engineering support. Now, that's fairly standard, isn't it? But he does something else, doesn't he? The, 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 the next bit is the thing that gets him really marked out for the future. Because from March 1900, what does he do? Well, he develops the whole concept of the demolition raid, which is designed to cut the Boers' rail communications and others, you know. Uh, and with his unit, he, he usually, accompanied by a, a cavalry squadron, pushes on a series of deep raids into Boer territory. A really, really dangerous business that demanded courage, cool-headed decision-making uh, and the, the situations of great pressure. I mean, this is real danger. This is behind enemy lines. And he wouldn't have time to think, would he? I mean, he's got to take these decisions at a moment's notice. There's no, no time to fanny about thinking uh, uh, for a long time because by then it'd be too late. Now, he also, he, he takes an individual role. He sets the explosives. Well, uh, himself. Yeah, he's, he sets the wow. charges himself. And these, these raids really catch the public imagination. He was considered a slashing man of action. And he begins to atta- attract the, uh, the the attention of uh, war correspondents. And you can see, uh, indeed, I looked them up on the British newspaper uh, report. And, and this is a typical breathless one that we found, wasn't it? Uh, uh, can you read it in a breathless manner, please? <sighs> During the advance on Kroonstad, General French, after crossing the Zand River, tried to secure the railway beyond the town in order to demoralise the retreat of General Botha's forces. Eventually, having advanced some distance, it was impossible to move further. The force had marched 40 miles and had been two days without supplies, but Major Hunter Weston and the scout Burnham, with eight mounted sappers and one squadron, started with the object of cutting the railway. The squadron was subsequently left behind as being too cumbersome for the delicate operation. They came in contact with patrols of the enemy and found that the Boers had a systematic line of pickets. Turning in towards uh, America siding, they found the Boer army retreating. Some were bivouacking along the line. Major Hunter Weston and Burnham were forced to proceed alone. They surprised a vedette post of two men and took them prisoners. They were repeatedly challenged by passing boers, but affected a ruse by lying down, their horses in the dark being then mistaken for loose animals. Major Hunter Weston and Burnham again crept forward and lay down by the side of the road. Wagons, guns and troops of the retreating enemy passing close by and almost over them. Under cover of the noise of the wagons, they succeeded in arriving at the railway railroad at a point where they had the shelter of the embankment and again watched commando after commando of mounted boars passing within a few yards of them then the charge having been laid and the fuse lighted they crept back as before and rejoined the party an explosion followed causing a buzz of excitement and alarm among the boars the party dashed clear in loose formation and encountered a strong patrol whom they captured 
They broke their rifles, brought away seven prisoners and ran the gauntlet under heavy fire, suffering only one slight casualty. Now, that sounds like a commando, Second World War commando raid to me. Uh, commando being a term from the Boer War as well. Uh, it, it's pretty exciting. So the other point I'd notice is, would you say Fred was a loose animal? <laughs> Very loose at the moment. <laughs> um, so the, you can see this is, this is, this is an exciting... Um, what, ca- what characteristics do you think he's showing? He's showing courage. He's showing an, uh, a willingness to take personal risk. Uh, he takes responsibility. He'll go forward on his own. He sets the charges. He takes the decisions. And, and, and he's an effective officer. And he's doing this quite a lot. A lot. Um, and uh, I do find it amusing, of course, the next bit, that as the British advance, guess who had to repair the railway lights? <laughs> Well, it'd be the Royal Engineers. <laughs> he so did. the same, same railway lines that they damaged. Yeah, great stuff. Now, he's then appointed to be our favourite position. What is he appointed to be? Deputy Assistant Adjutant General on French's staff, the Cavalry Division. And how do you pronounce that, Gary? Dog. Dog. So, so at this point, Hunter Weston's a dog. Well, that sounds fairly similar to the path that that Haig followed. He was dog at one stage. He was. He? I think he was chief of staff at this time. Uh, so he's now a substantive as opposed to brevet major. And the cavalry division, they're, they're busy trying to stop the Boers in the eastern Transvaal and they go backwards and forwards. Uh, then in December 1900, he actually becomes French's chief of staff as Haig gains command of a column. Remember, we talked about uh, Haig going off to command a, a brigade strength column. And it's, it's a huge task, organising the logistics of all these... Columns are going here, there, and everywhere about the Transvaal. A really interesting job for him, uh, but we've covered that a lot, so we'll glide by. 1901, April 1901, he's promoted to Brevet Lieutenant Colonel, uh, so an acting, a sort of acting but promising rank. Um, so he's only just behind Haig, isn't he? Really, because Haig's only the same rank, really, and he's awarded the DSO. Uh, and uh, it's generally considered a well-deserved one. The yeah, event... I think at this stage I'd say that in Gordon Corrigan's Mud, Blood and Poppycock, there's a there's a quote about his activities behind Boer lines, and it, he describes it as uh, reckless courage combined with technical skill and great coolness in an emergency. So he's a very brave, effective officer in that type of warfare. Uh, he's uh, he's eventually he's, uh, they're, they're in the Cape Colony from June 1901. This is the period, and he's also given a column. He's following in Haig's footsteps again, given a column. He's chasing backwards and forwards until he gets hospitalised. And this is uh, quite interesting because it happens again later on in his life. He gets a yeah, fever. It's a fever, isn't it? Gets fever in October. Hospitalised. Goes back to duty too soon. Wants to get back. Uh, ignores the doctors in a sense, has a relapse, and he's invalided home in January 1902. Um, so after he'd, he'd been a brilliant commander of an RE company, and now he's showing an, a, a great aptitude for staff duties. We're going to have to draw a bit of a veil over most of his interwar period, well, interwar, between Boer and uh, First World War. But in 1911, he becomes assistant director of military training at the war office, uh, by this time, he's gained a, a, a reputation. What would you say he was? He's um... Well, he's very innovative, isn't he? And, and he's demonstrated that innovation. He's very intelligent. Um, and uh, uh, he, he advocates the cooperation of all arms in a unified role, which, you know, as you and I both know, becomes critical during the Great War. So he's promoted to Brigadier General, commanding the 11th Brigade in February 1914. What I want you to notice, therefore... Is he's a lieutenant colonel in January 1914. Uh, he's promoted the next month. Uh, it's war. How does this war go? Uh, well, it starts well, doesn't it? it? There's relative success in the confusion of Le Coteau and the, and the great retreat, not the running away, that followed. Please, and saying run away, running away can be considered an insult. <laughs> yes, it can. Now, although he's exhausted himself, he tries his best to inspire his tired men and keep their morale up and uh, keep them moving, you know, uh, at the best pace possible. How do the men respond to his encouragement? Are they filled with admiration for the officer telling them? Well, here's a quote from Private Edward Rowe of the 1st East, East Lancashire Regiment. And... Uh, 
I, I suppose you could say that the uh, the well-meaning efforts fell on stony ground. He says, Our brigadier is a pest. For the past two days he's been riding up and down on the flanks of the battalion, shouting, Cover off by the left, hold your heads up, swing your arms, left, right, left, right. Everyone is grumbling and remarking, It's all right for you, Hunter. You're on horseback. Your feet are not sore. You have not averaged 35 miles per day for the last nine days in full pack and almost nant to eat. If we had, we had no time to cook or eat it. If you cannot give us encouragement, for Christ's sake, don't bully us. That was like he was in the room. Thanks. It was... It was a dead, mouldering... So... I'm, I meant a dead, mouldering corpse. <laughs> I thought you meant it was my best so far. It was your best accent so far, and I'm, I'm expecting a storm of praise. On, on I'm not entirely sure what accent it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was a wonderful accent, whatever it was. Uh, when the tide turns, he, he shows a lot of initiative, and uh, uh, it's mentioned that when they're trying to cross the uh, Ain River, that the Germans had tried to demolish the, one of the bridges uh, on the on the night of the twelfth of September, and he goes forward and he sees that although the, the bridge is down, some of the uh, girders uh, uh, and and the concrete, uh, the actual roadway, that the, uh, are still there, and it he as an engineer assesses that it's strong enough. To, uh, to to get across for the infantry to go across carefully, I would say, uh, and he orders his men across. Uh, no hesitation, usual thing with him. No hesitation whatsoever, and he orders them forward onto the ridge. And I love the orders he give. You see, uh, there 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 are three bumps in front of you. <laughs> That's, uh, get them. <laughs> I love it. He means the ridge, I think. Uh, after a winter in the trenches, he's promoted to Major General and given command of the 29th Division, uh, which are going out to Gallipoli as part of the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force under the overall command of... General Sir Ian Hamilton. Hurrah! Now, um, what does Hunter Went Western think about the prospects of the landings? Well, how does he express? Uh, what does is, does he think it's going to be easy? Does he underestimate the Turks? Does he think it's going to be a, a laugh? What does he say? No, he says that uh, no loss would be too heavy and no risks too great if thereby success would be attained. But there is not in present circumstances a reasonable chance of success. Now, he goes further. He writes to his wife on the 7th of April saying uh, that the odds against us are heavy. However, nothing is impossible. And this demonstrates that, you know, the British can do point of view instead of you know, sticking to his guns about it being impossible, there's this can-do attitude. There. So they're going to buckle to, put their put their uh, shoulders to the wheel and other cliches, but they, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. Uh, he actually, my favourite phrase of all time from him was, he, he says, uh, he says uh, that uh, they would end up, if they landed, they'd end up like a cow stuck halfway up a tree. Uh, and that is exactly, of course, what happens. Uh, it, it's, well, a cow uh, gets stuck halfway up a tree. No, the British Army gets stuck halfway up Ellis. <laughs> oh, how would the cow, mind you? He wasn't cow... alone in this, though, was he? This can-do mentality was was uh, rife amongst all of the, 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 the British officers of the time. Uh, absolutely. And uh, and uh, Vice Admiral John D. Robert thinks it's risky to land troops at night. Uh, the, 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 the people are pointing out the risks. However, there's that other strand of Hunter Weston's character, isn't there? And that's illustrated, and this is going to become increased. He's got a sort of braggadocio, a sort of loud boastfulness, and uh, a just over dramatic personality. Remember those amateur dramatic days? And this is another quote from him. Uh, that this goes out to the men. I think it must be one of the most intimidating uh, orders of the day that's ever, that was ever issued. Basically, you're all going to die. Yeah, now bear in mind, this is the order of the day for the 25th of April, 1915. This is the date of the landings. And he says, The eyes of the world are upon us, and your deeds will live in history. To us now is given an opportunity of avenging our friends and relatives who have fallen in France and Flanders. Our comrades there willingly gave their lives in thousands and tens of thousands for our king and country. 
and by their glorious courage and dogged tenacity, they defeated the invaders and broke the German offensive. We also must be prepared to suffer hardships, privations, thirst and heavy losses by bullets, by shells, by mines, by drowning. Very cheery. Very yeah, cheery. Really cheery. The only thing you missed out there was cows falling from trees. Yes, I could. Well, cows are the enemy of my family. One of them brutally attacked by a sister. Now, um, uh, they, they, the British thought they were opposed at Helles, which is the tip of the peninsula where the British 29th Division were landing. And we've done podcasts on this. Look back in our notes. So we're not going to go into great detail about this. They thought there was a full division of Turkish troops there. There was a battle between roughly equal forces. Uh, but, but in fact, there's only one battalion, just about a thousand men guarding the whole of the Hellas Peninsula to the, now, to the south of Achibaba, which is a dominating hill. They didn't have any machine guns. Uh, they didn't have much artillery support. They didn't have any landmines, despite the warning. Not, not feasible. Uh, but what, what do they have? Because the Turks have got something. What have they got? But they've got good leadership for starters. They've got experienced, well-trained troops. And above all, they've got rifles, good rifles. And they know how to use them. Uh, now this, the British overestimate of Turkish forces sort of dominates the day. When men, men heard the sound of their own machine gun fire and they thought they were being flayed by Turkish machine guns uh, in improbable numbers. They thought sort of a minor platoon or a most accompanied Turkish counterattack. They thought there's sc- thousands, 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 there's thousands of screaming Turks coming. Um, and during all the landings, where, where is Hunter to Western? I, I'm setting you up for this because I know you can't pronounce the name of the ship. Where was Hunter Weston? Well, in, in, he and his staff were aboard the Euralius. Not bad effort. Euralius. Ura, Ura, uh, which is situated just off W Beach. Uh, so he's quite unaware of what's really happening. And he, he certainly wasn't aware of the scale of the disaster that was unfurling at V Beach. And he's also unaware of the opportunities that are perhaps at X Beach or S Beach or, or ludicrously Y Beach. Uh, and he, he has a, an underlying preference, doesn't he, for sticking to the original plan. Um, now, once ashore, and we're gliding through this, uh, he's given responsibility by Hamilton uh, for a series of attacks uh, launched with the intention of capturing Achi Baba, the dominant hill. Uh, what are these battles called? Which was called? the objective of the first day. First day objective, absolutely, Gary. Uh, second day objective was uh, the Kilid Bahia Plateau, which is behind it, which they never get anywhere near. Uh, what do they call the battles? Uh, well, uh, it's the first, second and ultimately third battles of Krithia. Now, the first and second, we, we've talked about the second a lot in a podcast. You can look that up. They're, they're, they're crude, aren't they? Uh, they're, 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 well, we they're described based... them as advanced to contact, didn't we? They, yeah, they and they're were based both... on desperation. They have to do it. And this is the whole thing that he said, that he actually referenced. That you quoted him. Uh, you want something, and so you hope you can do it. It's a sort of wish fulfilment, isn't it? Oh, I'd really like to take Achi Baba, so I'm going to try. Uh, they had no chance, really. Um, the, the Turkish defences are improving all the time. More and more Turkish reinforcements are arriving, and uh, it's just hopeless. And what does it end up as? We, 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 we said what it ended up in Second, second Krithia. If at first you don't succeed... Give up. Now, that's your motto in life. Try, 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 try again. Try, try. I mean, it, it was unrealistic in the extreme. And we've talked about the plans and just keep doing the same thing and getting the same results. We've talked about that in previous podcasts. But the result is that uh, there was there were swathes of casualties. And, was, and it, that, was it Hunter Weston's fault? <sighs> it was in the sense that he did keep trying uh, the same plan, but you've got to hold Hamilton up uh, as being responsible, frankly. He was being pressured by Ham- Hamilton, who was in turn being pressured by the politicians back in the UK. So ultimately, it's the politicians who wanted this result. So it's shared blame. Hunter Weston's plan's not particularly good, I would say. The uh, uh, second Corinthian, there's a, there's a, well, both first and second, there's a sort of swing. The, the, the troops are meant to pivot on the French, and it's all a bit complicated and a bit unlikely. However, 24th of May, what happens? Well, he's promoted, which, you know, given you would think that uh, he hadn't been particularly successful, particularly with the attacks on Corinthian, he is promoted to Lieutenant General. 
and he's given command of the, the, the newly constituted 8th Corps, which is bringing together 29th Division, Royal Naval Division, 42nd Division, and the 49th Indian Infantry Brigade. So, huge responsibility. So, let's get this straight. He was a Lieutenant Colonel in January of 1914, and he's a Lieutenant General in May of 1915. Yes. So, a year and four months, he's gone from Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel, to Lieutenant General. Yes. We'll, we'll come back to this. That sounds ridiculous. Now, the third battle of Crithius gives him more chance to show his generalship, I think. 4th of June, 1915. By now, is it an advance to contact? No. It, it, what it is is continuous lines, more than one line, up to three lines stretching right across the peninsula. Is the scope for manoeuvre? No. So they're going to have to... They've got to attack. Uh, and... and uh, I think Hunter Weston and his staff come up with a fairly imaginative set of orders. Um, and they remind me of something. What do they remind you of? Well, they're a bit like bite and hold, aren't they? Um, although it's nowhere near the level of uh, artillery that, uh, in, that was used later in the war. But uh, the idea is, is a preliminary bombardment. It's, de- it's designed to destroy the Turkish trenches. And then... Uh, they even introduced this cunning plan, which I think uh, uh, we've talked about previously. The guns would suspend firing at 11.20 to encourage the Turks to get back and man their positions before the bombardment would resume again after half an hour. Did that work? No. No, of course it didn't. But it, it shows uh, an intelligent man tra- well, or, and his staff trying something out. Uh, yeah, I mean, you've even got the uh, Royal Naval Division armoured cars at this point. But it, but it is a, you know, it's a, 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 a prescient for uh, armoured warfare of the future. Perhaps so it's a willingness to, it's a willingness to try new technology. Did, did the armoured cars work well? Well, we, we've seen the terrain, haven't we? Um, no, but, but it was tried, and, and you, you've got to remember the Turks had dynamic opposition. You know, they, they're not, they're not just going to sit and watch all this happening. And uh, as you said, they had good leadership too. So it's another defeat, I'm afraid. And then he comes up with something else. So, uh, in cooperation with the then French corps commander, uh, uh, well, uh, General Henri Gourard. Uh, and they come up with a... Uh, uh, now, this really is bite and hold. What they're going to do is contract all the artillery resources along the whole line on a very small chunk of the Turkish line. Um, uh, and, and they try this. First, the French try it. Uh, and then the the British try it, so there's uh, the, uh, and they, they do make progress. And then they try it one time too many. Uh, the Battle of Twelfth of July, and there's a, a, a there's an absolute disaster because the Turks have got used to it. They can fire into it from both sides. And the, all the problems of bite and hold come to roost. Um, well, I, I think by this time, Hunter Weston's big, almost mechanistic in his beliefs, isn't he? He seems to have just it. He's just started to rely on a huge artillery bombardment with a load of high explosive fire uh, shells, preferably fired by howitzers. But they don't have a lot of shells. They don't have howitzers. And, and, and they were facing strongly defended positions. So it's not going to work. They're, only, they're not going to get very far. Um, oh, that doesn't mean he was wrong, though, I think. I think he was, had they had more artillery, it may well have worked. But they didn't, and they never were going to get it. Why weren't they going to get it? Well, the Western Front would, would take uh, precedent in, in all things at this time, wouldn't they? And, of course, you had the shell shortage of 1915. Now, something then happens. Uh, he, he gets ill. He gets uh, sunstroke. Now, there's lots of stuff saying he didn't get sunstroke. All the evidence is he got sunstroke. Uh, a bit like in... Uh, and on 25th of July, 1915, he's evacuated. Uh, but there's an illumin- illuminating uh, encounter with Hunter Wesson uh, between Lieutenant George Davidson of the 89th Field Ambulance. And it, it's quite interesting. This, 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 he, he has a chat with him. And what, what, t- t- tell us what he says. Most of the day, I'd been watching the battlefield from the observation hill. Then at 5pm, went to tea in the mess where I was alone. General Hunter Weston entered in a few minutes and, sitting opposite me, said, What an extraordinary thing war is. The progress of the day had greatly satisfied him, I could see, and he was in great glee. Yes, I said, but I wish to goodness it was all over. My dear sir, he replied, we'll have years of it yet. I asked if he thought there was any possibility of it ending this year. Absolutely none. 
So how would we sum up the Gallipoli experience for Hunter Weston? I think he's a, a, a man driven by a sense of duty to attempt the impossible. Um, but the other thing about him, though, is his tendency and to, to, to make unfortunate remarks that resound through the, the sort of decades, the years, uh, as almost the epitome of gross insensitivity. And this is why he gets, this is what upsets people, and this is why he's not popular. So just to give a couple of examples, after the slaughter of 156th Brigade attack, uh, almost unsupported by artillery, and this the Scots feel very bitterly about, uh, uh, on the uh, 28th of June, he calls it uh, blooding the pups. Now, that's not sensitive. And then there's another quote. Now, this is interesting because it's quoted by a staff officer, um, Compton McKenzie. Uh, and uh, it, 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 uh, it's where uh, Hunter West annoys Major General Sir Archibald Paris. He's the person commanding the Royal Naval Division. And I'll just, I'll read this one. Uh, I'll do it in my usual voice. Uh, Many casualties, asked General Paris in a voice that could not hide the bitterness he felt over the losses of his own splendid division. And as as I think of General Hunter Weston's reply, I fancy I see a falcon strike angrily at some grizzled, trusty old dog like Fred. Casualties, he cried, uh, eyes flashing, aquiline nose quivering. (laughs) What, what do I care for casualties? (laughs) The... This is often quoted. You know, you hear it all the time. Uh, Casualties. What do I care for casualties? It means he's grossed incentive. But the thing is, that's not the end of the quote. Compton McKenzie goes on to say this. And this is never quoted. Well, rarely quoted. Compton McKenzie says, Now, it would be quite easy to deduce from this brief exchange of words that General Hunter Weston was a mere butcher. And there's no doubt that, because he never did hesitate to talk in this ruthless strain, he did achieve such a reputation on the peninsula. Actually, no men I have ever met brimmed over more richly with human sympathy. He was a logician of war, and as a logician he believed and was always ready to contend in open debate that provided the objective was gained, casualties were of no importance. Now, I cross swords with Hunt, uh, Compton McKenzie here. Uh, he, d- he doesn't, he isn't, he isn't brimming over with no. human sympathy, is he, Gary? No. He's just not. Um, he's a man that says stupid things. He's not stupid, but he's a man who says stupid, insensitive things uh, because he inhabits a sort of world in his head where he's the great captain and he says things like this, pour on courage, les autres, or whatever. I don't know what he's doing. Um, has he been successful in Gallipoli? What do you think, Gary? No, you know, as we mentioned, he he was a very uh, innovative man. He was trying uh, new tactics. Uh, he he was trying to 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 overcome the, the the problems of facing a determined enemy in conditions of trench warfare without a crushing superiority of artillery. It's it he fails, but it's not surprising that he fails. Generals all along the Western Front have got the same problem. <laughs> I was just going to say that, Gary. It, it, just, it is. Nobody does well in 1915 in these circumstances. So it's not a surprise that, 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 they, they, that Hunter Weston fails at Gallipoli, where he's on a front. Everything's against him, in a sense. And uh, he may have moments of piercing insight, but the moments of piercing the insight are that you shouldn't be there and you shouldn't do it. Uh, so, but he's trying to do it. And uh, hence why the, I also disagree with Compton McKenzie, who's saying he believed it was always ready, uh, provided the objective was gained, casualties were of no importance. Well, the objective isn't gained, is it? They don't take Achi Baba, uh, so the casualties are of importance because they're a waste of men. Anyway, so uh, what happens when he gets to the West Front? Is everything all right then? Does everything go well? Well, let's face it, it you know, it, it, just think about the clicking of the clock here. So 1915, he's in Gallipoli. He goes to the Western Front. What happens in 1916? Would it be the Somme? It's the Somme. 
Dan, and he, dan, he's dan. got command of the newly constituted 8th Corps on the northern flank of the main Somme offensive, the, which is conducted by the British 4th Army on the 1st of July. So that's that's some reward. He's uh, he's been uh, set up here for failure. Not not in a... I mean, he's been rewarded in a sense, but he's also been set up for failure. Is he aware of the problems? Yes, but he's again unable to overcome them. Uh, he, he knows what the problems are. He can't sort them out. He tries to envisage every eventuality, and it, as a result... Well, how would you describe his orders for the great attack on the 1st of July? Go on. Go on. How, well, how would it's, you... over, it's overcomplicated and excessively detailed, and as a result, it's rigid. So, And, not... and if you're on the receiving end of those orders, <laughs> you probably didn't understand them. Now, one of the worst things is the timing of the detonation of the mine at Hawthorne Redoubt. Now, this is a great... Oh, I don't know. People go on and on about it. What? What the background to it? Well, I'll sum it up very briefly and you tell me what you think. He wanted to set off the mine four hours before the main assault to ensure that the crater that would result was, was, was taken so that it clear away for the main assault at 7.30. He wanted to do that because he, 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 he wanted the, 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 the Hawthorne Ridge captured. Uh, because it dominated the area his corps was going to attack in. So he wanted to do it first. Um, what happens? What happens? Well, um, he, he wasn't allowed to, uh, and there's lots of consultation flying backwards and forwards. Um, um, the, there's all sorts of things. as the German superiority in crater fighting. People get worried, and they all decide to compromise. What do they compromise on? They'll set it off not four hours later, ten minutes early at 7.20. What do you think of that decision? Don't compromise. You either go four hours early um, or you don't go early at all. There's no compromise in that situation. If, if the argument for four hours early withstood scrutiny and i'm not sure whether it did or didn't then you stick to your guns and if, it, if you can't get it then you go with the overall plan i think you're right so when the hawthorne mine explodes the the guns lift their thing and and the germans are warned by the explosion of the mine and then they're left in relative peace for 10 minutes uh before the 29th Division. Poor old 29th. They called them the Immortal 29th Division. I've never known of a more inappropriate name for a division that is continually slaughtered. <laughs> and uh, immortal and you, can, you can see in the, uh, the film, The Battle of the Somme, you can see the attempt to take this Hawthorne crater. Uh, and you can see the men coming under fire and running down to the left. And it's described in great detail in uh, um, uh, Steve Roberts' book. I think it's called The Ghosts of the Somme. Yeah, good, excellent work by Steve, who has gone through that film in detail. But it's worth watching, not for the fake going over the top, but for the actual film. No, no, film. that is real, and you can see the troops rushing to take the crater and being forced down to the left, and that's because the Germans are opening fire on them. Now, one thing I would point out is that all along the 8th Corps front, there's a disaster. It's not just in front of the Hawthorne crater. And this is the, the PALS battalions of the 31st Division, and they're slaughtered, slaughtered in front of Serre. Uh, the regulars of 4th Division are cut to ribbons on the Serre and Bowman Hamill. It, it doesn't seem to make much difference what happens. They're all slaughtered. Um, is this attack a success? No point asking. No, it's an utter and complete failure. Eighth Corps, Hunter Western, fail. They don't disturb the German defences at all. And when they try and resuscitate the attacks, they all fail um, against the dominance of no man's lands by uh, not just machine guns of legend, but of the five point batteries of 5.9s that open up because they hadn't been suppressed by counter battery fire. And they just smash, uh, smash anything that they try um they've got no chance really uh it doesn't matter whether they're pals or regulars they can't really do anything against these odds um what uh what, what so hunter weston issues an order of the day and uh, and his comments on the disaster what does he say gary to all officers ncos and men of the eighth army corps in so big a command as an army corps of four divisions about 80,000 men, it's impossible for me to come round all frontline trenches and all billets to see every man as I wish to do. You must take the will for the deed and accept this printed message in place of the spoken word. 
It is difficult for me to express my admiration for the splendid courage, determination and discipline displayed by every officer, NCO and man of the battalions that took part in the great attack on the Beaumont Hamel Sayre position on the 1st of July. All observers agree in stating that the various waves of men issued from their trenches and moved forward at the appointed time in perfect order, undismayed by the heavy artillery fire and deadly machine gun fire. There were no cowards nor waverers, and not a man fell out. It was a magnificent display of disciplined courage worthy of the best traditions of the British race. Now that is blather. It, it's just nonsense. It, it, it is just blustering. Um, um, it's the sort of thing that you get uh, issued to uh, just uh, to, to try and look good. Of course, there were men uh, falling out. Of course, there were cowards. Of course, there were waverers. Most of them did their duty as best they could, but they were slaughtered. Uh, and you're basically trying to deflect attention from it by saying how brilliantly they did. Some reports actually said the 8th Corps hadn't done very well and hadn't all come out of the trenches. Those are equally wrong. Uh, they tried their best. Um, now, what happens to Hunter Weston after this? Well, our story's going to collapse a bit, isn't it? Yeah, he gets very limited opportunities after this to shine. Um, he, he does continue as a corps commander on the, the quiet fronts until Why the end of the Hague war. Why doesn't Haig sack him then? <sighs> well, he, he he's still an innovator, isn't he? he he's still a skillful. Uh, commander. He starts uh, the core school to improve skill levels of the divisions that pass through his command. And, it, and towards uh, uh, 1917 and the major offensive, 8th Corps becomes a bit of a training formation. Um, but he does get involved. No, but he does get involved again towards the end of the war. He, so he's not used in the major offensives uh, uh, in 17. It, it, it is like a training function. Um, yeah, and, 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 you know, we mentioned his personality earlier. He does... He does continue to posture as the great general. Now, it's that. getting out of hand now, isn't it, though? Do you not think? Yeah. Well, yeah, he has a love of inspections, parades and VIP visits. And uh, it, there's almost a, 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 a pooterish element to him by this stage. I, might, I was just tempted to ask you to explain pooterish, but <laughs> it, it's George Grossmith and, and the character of Pooter, who, who, who is so pompous and nobody understands. He he's just he just doesn't understand what's going on around him and how everybody else thinks he's a knob, and this is this is what's happening to Hunter West, isn't it? And you're going to read a couple of quotes now that, that he's saying one thing, but we know what people are thinking. So he's thinking, ah, they all love me, and everybody's thinking, you knob. And I looked up Pooterish, thanks very much, and I didn't get a word in. <laughs> <laughs> I was so sure. I thought you. <laughs> Because there has been harsh criticism of me for ambushing you before. <laughs> Obviously, you saw that ambush coming. Anyway, he says, I always make a point when going round to make my inspections quite different to the ordinary general's Ordinary, The ordinary general. <laughs> I never go round to find fault. I only go round to assist and help, which I do by hanging <laughs> talks onto some good or bad point. My inspections, I think, are therefore enjoyed rather than dreaded, except by the real slackers. So how would you have felt? <laughs> I'd have been one of the real slackers, I think. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the, the next one is even funnier. I just think the next one is just hilarious. Go on. It, this really is pooterish. Yesterday, I spent the morning in going round the heavy artillery with a retinue of generals, colonels, etc. And to them, I gave addresses on various essentials of their job. They were very interested and <laughs> thanked me for what I had taught them. It's a, it is curious to find that in almost all the different arms, which vary so much in their material and training, I know a good deal more of these officers' jobs than they do. However, I suppose that's what ought to be the case with a general. Now, who does that remind you of? A certain, a certain leader of the free world. Mm. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Um, oh, he might not be leader of the free world by the time this comes out. There you go, a former ex-leader of the free. But this idea, it, it the pop, the level of pomposity. What do you think those officers really thought? Those those uh, those experts, as as he explained to them what their job was. What do you think they're sat in front of him thinking? Well, they probably thought he was completely irrelevant, bit of an old dodderer, and you know, sort of Colonel Blimp type character. I should imagine. Now, um, 
there's another story. Now, this this was came about in the newspapers after death, but it shows the same sort of thing. And I'll read this one um, be, because, it, again, it's just hilarious. Well, it depends on your sense of humour. The pomposity. Uh, the, the, he was known throughout... This is a newspaper reporter. Uh, he was known throughout the BF in the last war for his way of unexpectedly stopping a private soldier and asking if he recognised him. On being told no... He would ask the private's name, and then and then he'd say, "Ah, I am Lieutenant General Sir Aylmer Hunter Weston. Uh, yeah, 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 you're a private Smith. Now we know each other." <laughs> I, just, I just can you imagine that if it was Private Gary, what you would have thought? <laughs> I'd have told people I know Sir Aylmer Hunter Weston. <laughs> Now, he still excels all through the war at some of the less glamorous basics of the trade. He, he does, he does, he, he keeps himself fit. He regularly inspects the front-line trenches throughout his whole com- command. Uh, in fact, his visits become notorious because of his keenness and, and making sure of high standards, uh, particularly uh, at the latrines. And this becomes a standing joke. Why? But... There's a, I think there's a reason for why he was obsessed with latrines. <laughs> but, all right, let's make it two reasons. But let's not mention one of the reasons. <laughs> Can you... I presume you mean Gallipoli and the fact that, you know, we've talked before about dysentery and diarrhoea in the Gallipoli campaign and the importance of, of latrines and, and their situation in regards to the troops. So it isn't a surprise. It isn't. It doesn't and, surprise and... me at all. No, and I think it's quite, it, uh, latrines are important. Uh, he also has a, a job, he moonlights. It's now, it's rare for a general, a lieutenant general in charge of a corps on the Western Front to moonlight, but he's got another job, hasn't he? Now, you might say that the other job is an unimportant, uh, but, but and, and uh, in fact, ideal for a windbag with no principles or uh, sort of moral fibre. Uh, what is his other job? I think he's a, a, a Scottish unionist in, uh, in Parliament. He's a member of Parliament. He is. He is. He's a, he's a member of Parliament, uh, and he acts as an unofficial spokesman for the army uh, there. And and I think Haig uses him as a sort of conduit, uh, another unofficial conduit. Uh, and maybe one reason that Haig didn't sack him, I've I've no idea. Um, there is a sort of swan song. I wish we had more time for this, but uh, uh, but we haven't. Uh, and I want to do some more work on this. He does well in the in the hundred days, doesn't he, Gary? Um, yeah. Um, 1918. Um, this. What, why does he do well? What do, what do you think he shows? What does he demonstrate in those hundred hundred well, days? Well, he's mastered. He's mastered the the all arms tactics and and the requirement for increased flexibility. That's arguably something that he was trying to do in Gallipoli. But he's also demonstrating his personal bravery again. He conducts personal reconnaissance right right at the front where it where it demanded it. it it's all of the attributes that he's demonstrated throughout his career coming to the fore in 1918 he may or may not have learned uh, that's why i want to do some more work you mentioned flexibility what were we just saying about the somme inflexible orders he's demonstrating a flexibility this is an intelligent man he's made some mistakes on the somme and he's attempting to sort it out it's it's quite interesting isn't it does he get any chance after the war does he go anywhere else no he doesn't does he uh he leaves the army in 1919 uh continues to be an mp until 1935 that is of course a less important job um now how does he die um well, he, he dies at the age of 75 on the 18th of March, 1940. And, it, and it's, it's somewhat strange, the circumstances, because he fell from a turret at his ancestral home in Hunterston. And you're going to read a, a, a newspaper report of his death. I am. British General's tragic death fall from turret to his Scottish home and notable army career. Lieutenant General Sir Aylmer Hunter Weston was killed on Monday through car falling from his turret at his home at Hunterston, West Kilbride, Ayrshire. Although he was 76 years of old, Sir Aylmer climbed the tower every day to keep fit and admire the wonderful view over the Firth of Clyde. He went up as usual in the morning, and a few minutes after he left, the people in the house heard a crash on the roof of the veranda surrounding the ground floor of the house. I wonder if it was a Scottish newspaper. I think it was actually an English newspaper. I'm speechless. 
Yeah, I wish I was at times. Now, a chum of ours, um, he hates me at the moment, but George Webster, um, he, he went there and he was taken up onto the turret and he said two things that are interesting. The first was he didn't think you could accidentally fall off it. Perhaps he was murdered. Murdered. It's been a murder. <laughs> no, I think the suggestion is something else, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. We don't know. Uh, the other thing he pointed out was that until very recently, there was a dent in the lead roof where his head had landed. I thought that was great. I always wanted to go and see that. However, they've hammered it out. Spoiled sports. Um, let's assess Hunter Weston, shall we? Um, come on, then. Let's make some points. You go first. Well, Napoleon said that, you know, his most uh, uh, prized asset in a general was to be lucky. And Hunter Weston definitely was not a lucky general. Not not, not as a general. Uh, lucky perhaps early in life, but not as a general. Absolutely. Uh, what were his two main biggest campaigns? Gallipoli and the Somme. Yeah, two, two of the easiest campaigns, weren't they? Um, he'd shown fantastic potential and a sharp intelligence in his early career. Uh, he'd, he'd done well and done showed those things, particularly in the Boer War. And he'd done well in 1914, hadn't he? Um, um, was he a nice man? No, it, there's no doubt that he was pompous and brash. And uh, you, can, you can tolerate that in a general that, that attains great success. You know, arguably Montgomery in the Second War, not a nice character. Pat um, or Pat oh, Patton, jeez, yeah. But they were successful. And you tolerate it if you're successful. Now, he's got a vision of himself. And I, I think the vision starts to become confused with reality. And, also, and it's a, this is the advice we go back to. He's come back to life now. He, he gives advice to Hamilton as to the qualities that would be needed by the commanders appointed for the August Stubler operation. So this is after he's left, in a sense. Final words to, to Hamilton, giving advice. Uh, you're going to read this. I pray to God that the new leaders of these new formations may know how to get hold of their men and lead them, and yet on occasion drive them unceasingly without any regard to losses or fatigue, without any regard to the yelping of subordinate commanders for reinforcement reinforcements or to their cry that their men are dead with fatigue. In the enterprise in which you are engaged, push unrelenting push without ceasing, push without mercy by a commander in whom the men have confidence is all important. Now, but then again, what did he say to Dardanelle's commission in February 1917? And it's not, it, it's a bit contradictory, I think. It, it, it shows, oh, I don't know. Uh, what, you read this. The one thing that a general thinks about all the time is sparing his men's lives. Never does a general attack unless he thinks by so doing he will in the end save lives. That is what our job is. We are very careful on the question of loss of life and the human suffering which must occur. Actually speaking, if an attack is well thought out, even if you lose life, you will probably save life in the end because you keep the other people apprehensive and they will not be able to concentrate on you and attack you with overwhelming force. Now, uh, that's also, I mean, these things are sort of true, but it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's not. What, what do you think the real problem is with Hunter Weston? Is, is, he's not stupid, is he? I mean, uh, one thing I want to make quite clear uh, uh, is if you think Hunter Weston's stupid, not, then you're probably a bit dim yourself. Uh, it, it, he does make, he acts stupidly at times. We all act stupidly at times in life. And Hunter Weston makes mistakes. He occasionally acts in a stupid manner. But it, it's clear he's not a stupid man. Um, what do you think the underlying problem is with his whole career in the First World War, uh, Gary? Well, I think, and you've made this point before, I think he is basically promoted too quickly. Uh, you know, he's a substantive colonel in January 1914 and he's a lieutenant general in May 1915. Now, he didn't promote himself. No, so he was, <laughs> it's not his fault. He's promoted. It's not his fault, but he is overpromoted far too quickly. And uh, it's the fastest rate of progress in the whole army. There is nobody who gets promoted. What's quicker. the problem? What, what, what we want, sir, we want competent people to be promoted. Why is it a problem, Gary? Explain to me. Why well, you, is don't, it a you don't get time to grow into the role. You, you, 
your education as a general gets truncated because you're you're just getting to grips with something and you've moved on to something else. You know, the difference between commanding uh, a, a company of men, a battalion of men moving right the way through to core. And he's had no time at all to acclimatise. And he's having to do it in the presence of a vigorous, well commanded and, and, and actually brilliant enemy, both the Turks and the Germans. Are you too- it's terrible. I mean, they're not easy, are they? And he's not the only one, but he's also hampered by a lack of experienced staff officers. You've over and over again, you've made the point about... Now, would that not be important officers. to a, an inexperienced uh, Major General or Lieutenant General? Wouldn't you need the most experienced possible staff officers? I think it's important to all of the generals, whether they're experienced or otherwise. Good staff work is essential. But it's, um, I, I think it's particularly bad if you if you're an inexperienced commander, you need experienced staff, and they're just not there, are they? Are they? Uh, do, 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 you don't seem to hear of this sort of promotion in the German army. Why would that be? Well, because they they wanted their generals to take time to gain experience, develop a, a command style, for want of a better word, so that they absorb the skills that are required in modern warfare. You you, you cannot expect a general to just be a general. It has to be learned like anything else. And, of course, the German army was expanding as planned, as opposed to the British army, which is just ridiculously expanding, and there just weren't enough general officers. And, and I think... Do you think he ever stood a chance? No, I think he was doomed to failure because of the impos- impossibility of much that he was actually ordered to attempt. Uh, he felt obliged, I think, through his sense of duty to try his best, and, frankly, it proved not to be good enough. I think that's a great way of finishing, Gary. I think you've summed it up brilliantly. I think we'll mention again, uh, if you want to read more about uh, Hunter Weston, then I I recommend you try A Slashing Man of Action by Elaine McFarland. And and all we ask you to do with Hunter Weston is you can hate his guts, if you like, although it's a bit ridiculous to hate someone who's been dead, best part of 70, uh, 80 years. Um, It's not not the most likeable of characters, is he, Gary? But... He's not a duffer. Hunter Bunter, it's the fact his name's Bunter, Billy Bunter. It's all this, because he's got a stupid moustache. They had stupid moustaches in nineteen in the First World War. It, he, he's not a particularly likeable character, but he isn't an idiot. He's not a fool. And in the Boer War, if, if his career had stopped in the Boer War, he'd, he'd be a great hero. Uh, and you want, you want particularly to make a couple of points about just finally about about you don't define someone by by one moment in time yeah i i mean it's not just hunter western you know these people had careers and and we look at them through a prism of the the great war and we make judgments about these people and and he's not the only one referred to as a butcher for example um and i i in In uh, reading about this, I'm going to come back to Mud, Blood and Poppycock because Gordon Corrigan argues that uh, this one mistake of the 1st of July around Hawthorne Crater has uh, obliterated all the good that he did before that point, during the Somme Offensive and afterwards, and that he doesn't deserve the vilification that, that he receives. And I think... You could be talking about a number of First World War generals there, not just Hunter Weston. None of them, none of them went into that war with the intention of killing their own men. Um, And and I just think that Hunter Weston is a bit of an example for more than just himself. You're right. Not a nice man. Really unfortunate comments. But... um, was he entirely to blame for what happened to him? No. Great, great summary, Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for joining me on Gary Bain's Military History. I've enjoyed every moment of it. Cheers, mate.